Yo, it's Austin. There's a ton of licensed games out there, like probably too many. You know about your Superman 64s, your Enter the Matrixes, but today I want to talk about some of the ones that you may not know about. Oh, you know, the games that make you turn your head and be like, wait, they made a game for that? The bottom of the barrel, the hidden gems, and most random licensed games of yesterday. I don't really have a particular order I want to show these in, as all 10 of these games are just ones I recall or found throughout my 57 years of living. And hey, if you played any of these, good on you. But more likely than not, you haven't. Which is also good on you for not playing them. <laughs> So hey, let's get this mystery box of licensed games opened up and start with the oldest console of the bunch, the Nintendo Entertainment System. During the 80s, licensed movie games were a dime a dozen. Despite all these consoles and personal computers being mostly targeted towards the children of the day, you'd see licensed games pop out for a very, uh not family-friendly franchises. For every Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or Adam's Family, you had a Friday the 13th or a Die Hard. You know, very hard R-rated movies. yippee mama I guess these were supposed to be the edgy games for older siblings or parental units, but I feel like these usually just slipped through and were played by whatever kids got their greasy hamster mitts on them. With the abundance of shit being constantly shoveled out, it should come as no surprise that somehow a Mad Max game got made. It's based off of The Road Warrior, which to me is still the best Mad Max movie. Can't beat that good old 80s nonsense. Weirdly though, it's actually just a remake of an Amiga game called Road Raiders, which had its name changed to Motor Massacre in some regions. Both of these games were very clearly just trying to be Mad Max though, so I mean, I guess that works. The game itself is your pretty standard NES fare. You drive around your post-apocalyptic car in a post-apocalyptic world, throwing dynamite at walls. You get out of the car, shoot dudes, and get supplies and, I don't know, keys and shit. It's very mediocre. As much as I love Mad Max, well, everything besides Thunderdome, the style of the original source material is kinda just better. I mean, look at these guys. Can't beat this colorful palette and these Homerian-esque noses. Mad Max plays a bit smoother and sounds a little less Amiga-y, but at the end of the day, it's just wild to me that this even exists. <laughs> Not just the game, but this swanky walk cycle. God damn. The long-standing superhero Batman has had a plethora of video games, some better than others. The PlayStation 1 era was a bit sketchy though, so I want to talk a little bit about the Ubisoft published Batman Gotham City Racer. Oh yeah, a racer. Somehow, somewhere, someone thought that making a racing game was a good idea. And you know what? In theory, that's not the worst idea ever. I heck and love me some kart racers, and a Batman-themed one sounds like it could be neato. Except we got two major problems here. Number one, it's not a kart racing game. It's closer to your Twisted Metals and Vigilante 8s. That's not inherently bad, even though I think car combat games were a mistake. No! Number two, it's made by Sinister Games, the people responsible for the absolutely fantastic, I'm not being sarcastic at all, Dukes of Hazard video games. Ones that I've had a run in with the past. We'll go this way. Excuse me? <laughs> what the? So, Batman. We're following that awesome cartoon, The New Batman Adventures. In the story mode, we get like a clip from the show and then we're thrust into gameplay, which is unfortunately as bad as it looks. Everything looks the same. I feel like I'm playing an early build of Death Stranding. Turning feels awful, the shooting things feels awful, the quality of the cutscenes is awful. Every mission is basically chase someone or get from point A to point B in a time limit. You can play as the heroes or villains or against a friend, but if you subject anyone to this, you're probably a bad person. It's not even fun bad, it's just bad bad. With a name like Gotham City Racer, I got excited for some kart racing shenanigans, but alas, that's not what we're playing. That's right, two coats of wax. Now a lot of you probably remember Monster Rancher, but have you heard of Monster Rancher Hopabout? Member of the community, Superfly1787 has, and uh, all I can say is f*** you. 
You may have seen the cartoon, you may have played the PlayStation games, you might even have played that one weird Game Boy Color card game where you start as a toddler who literally crawls on his knees, but you probably didn't play Hop About. Take Jumping Flash, take the old school game Bounder, then take a few Monster Rancher characters, toss in some random floating platforms, power-ups, and stat boosters, grind it all up, and boom, you got yourself this. <laughs> Hop about, or as it was known in Japan, Monster Farm Jump kind of just slid out over here in the States, and I'm not really sure how anyone thought that was a good idea. Especially in 2000, like months after the PlayStation 2 came out. Monster Rancher had a weird success in Japan that it never really saw in the States. It was always kind of like that other one standing next to Pokemon, Digimon, and like fighting Foodons. Well, I mean, looking at the screen right now, you've seen the entire game. You jump. If you dig this kind of game, then by all means, it's a solid Bounder clone, and like, that's it, really. Let's move on. Away from the musk. Speaking of games that shouldn't exist, why don't we go ahead and move on to Napoleon Dynamite for the PlayStation Portable. Yeah, you heard me, you musky b the older I get, the more I realize how much Napoleon Dynamite actually influenced the way I interact with people. Not in, like, an awkward manner, but by the fact that I say bullshit like, your mom goes to college. It's probably worse, to be honest. Despite the fact that on the third day the movie was showing at my theater, a friend and I had the theater to ourselves. Similarly to the way I saw Dragon Ball Evolution. Napoleon Dynamite sure was a movie. And for some reason, it got a video game. Two, actually, but the PSP one is the one I'm showing. Why does this exist? Anytime I saw the UMD laying around at a game store, even one I worked at, I thought it was just a movie, but no, it's an actual video game. A minigame compilation mini game that is small. The art style here is actually well done, but at the end of the day, it's just various low quality mini games, dumb writing, still frames of the movie pasted on the screen, and I, I just don't know. If you got this game by means of purchasing it with your own currency back in the day, please let me know because I have many questions. Speaking of things that you bought as a kid, the next game took me a while to find again. Now a lot of you have seen different iterations of The Jungle Book or played one of the many video games of The Jungle Book, but you haven't played this one. So, as luck would turn out, there's a Jungle Book video game based on the live-action movie. No, not the one with Bill Murray. That movie's pretty alright, though. It's actually based off the 1994 Jungle Book adaptation. You... you know, the one. So, what is it? How about a mid-90s FMV game? Oh, hell yeah! Here, we follow some dude named Colonel Ilguam. Yeah, not Mowgli or anyone who was actually in the story, but this guy. Just Mowgli spelled backwards. But cool fact, this guy is Gary Schwartz. You might know him as Heavy Weapons Guy, but if you're me, you know him as this guy, who talks to his monkey a lot. Ah! 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 Little yellow marks appear on the screen called Instinct, which you need to grab to get to the end of the game. There's hardly any puzzles, just mostly clicking to pick a direction. Even if a puzzle pops up and you fuck it up, the spirit of Mowgli, a giant yellow orb, tells you to try again, sweetie. I don't really understand the point of this game, and I have no idea how I played this as a kid. All I know is that when my family first got a PC, I had three games. This, Muppet Treasure Island, and the PC version of Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> Seriously. It's crazy how spoiled we are now. You might think you're looking at the full screen in this footage, but <laughs> it's actually more like this. I feel like the old live-action Jungle Book movie has started to fade into obscurity, but this video game even more so. But at least now you know there's a game out there where you have to heal Baloo with an herb. Using FMV magic? Alright, it's time for a change of pace. Y'all ever heard about the Olympics? <laughs> The Contest of Champions, the Game of the Ancients. I'd like to think that those who attended the original Olympics back in 776 BC knew that they'd eventually be able to play a video game about their beloved contest. However, an Olympics video game is by no means an uncommon or rare thing. In fact, the first time I learned a video game could be bad was Nagano Winter Olympics 98, but that's a story for another time. Starting in 1968, every Olympic game would have a cute or fun mascot, some more obscure than others. However, in 1996, everything would change. 
This is Izzy. He's really ugly. The first computer generated mascot, Izzy, which is short for, <clears throat> what is it? Spelled, what is it? Like one word, what is it? Was something its creators really wanted to stick around in people's minds. Izzy got himself a freaking cartoon now lost to time. As you can imagine though, Izzy was not received well at all. But somehow we got a video game, too, even. There's Izzy's adventure for the PC, but we're gonna be talking about Izzy's quest for the Olympic rings, the Genesis version. When I was a kid, the games I owned and bought weren't really up to me. I might be able to point at something and make a noise like, in an attempt to attain, but it didn't have a 100% success rate. We've all had experiences with video game store employees, so imagine my parents being sold the dang Izzy game, and here we are playing it. Clunky platformer, check. Weird, janky controls, check. Grading music, nonsensical power-ups, and an attempt to explain deep lore behind the actual Olympic rings? I thought that it just represented each continent that was taking part in the games, but hey, each level is this mess of platforms with no real sense of direction. The goals appear randomly. Some of the art is just an eyesore. It's all just a big, big mess, which is, I mean, appropriate for Izzy. I kind of feel like doing like a straight up history of Izzy video at some point because I mean, it's hilarious, but maybe we'll save that for another time. So I guess Izzy was like kind of a real person. Well, not like a real, real person, but was created by real people to exist in the actual fictional, not the fictional place, but the reality, reality place. <laughs> so why don't we shift gears a little bit and talk about one actual real person who was real, I guess, that they're dead now, but Bruce Lee for, for the Xbox. Bruce Lee is and always was one badass dude, an actor and martial artist so legendary that to this day, people still try to act as him in modern movies. Some of his iconic moves and outfits have been referenced in ways obvious and some more subtle, be it the bride from Kill Bill donning the same outfit or Sailor Jupiter doing the same moves. Name a day of the week and I'm probably down to watch Enter the Dragon. Bruce Lee is the bomb. So of course, of course, the dude would have to have a video game made about him. As a kind of weird moral disclaimer, I feel like creating video games based off the legacy of someone so recently alive in the grand scheme of human existence is kind of weird. Let's just say that if I were in charge of a video game studio, I wouldn't approve of putting Kurt Cobain into Guitar Hero. Yeah. Brucey's had a ton of games, some more notorious than others, but only the Xbox exclusive Quest of the Dragon seems to have quickly faded out of everyone's consciousness. Xbox exclusives. <laughs> Remember those? Bruce Lee is a beat-em-up, which is appropriate. His fighting style and moveset is very expansive. While you can just mash it out, take a look at all the possible combos you can do, cause it's uh, uh, uh... This is like halfway to being a Tekken. But I mean, if you look at the footage here, I'm sure you can see Bruce Lee, Quest of the Dragon. Oh no, thank you, little dragon. Oh yeah, it's a one of those games. Enemies just kind of throw themselves at you constantly. Not really in a matter that feels like manageable, but just this really fast, chaotic, cross your fingers and hope you hit the buttons good enough kind of way. Beyond your face button punches, you've also got fights with nunchucks and you can tilt the right analog stick in order to make Bruce punch in that direction. But it looks really weird. Unfortunately, this wasn't the first or last Bruce Lee video game, but it sure is the worst that I've played so far. I could literally make like an hour long video on just Bruce Lee games because there's so many, but I'd rather not. In the future, everyone should just do the thing where everyone just makes a Bruce Lee video game OC as opposed to using his likeness. We've already got like Forrest Law, Liu Kang, Jan Lee. Just, just do that. Please? It has been a while. Lee. Pretty please? Next up is a little GameCube game called Rave Master. Oh, Rave Master, how I read so much of you and watched some of you. If you're familiar with Fairy Tale, this is Hiromashima's first work. It was cool as heck when I was younger and Tokyo Pop started publishing manga left and right. I'd pop over to the bookstore, grab the latest issue, finish it in like 40 minutes, and then have to wait another month. Maybe trace some of the new chapter images totally to 
try and claim it as mine. I fell out of Rave Master because it just took so long to have it all come out over here in the States. So by the time the GameCube and Game Boy Advance games hit store shelves in 2005, I was like on to World of Warcraft or Death Note. In a year where Shadow of the Colossus, Resident Evil 4, and Devil May Cry 3 would come out, a niche anime tie-in with a smallish following in the States would be overshadowed by a giant colossus. So what is it? How's a Power Stone clone sound? That's pretty okay. You even got the big special attacks you can use. Your character's weapons aren't bound to them as they can get knocked out and you can use anything that spawns. But instead of a quick paced fun arcade story mode, we get static anime images. Static thick ass boys. The text interface in Rave is so ugly. It kind of just cuts over the characters and looks terribly spread out. It's yucky. But yeah, each of the main cast has their own story mode. Oh, and also, the end credits for Haru plays that real big fish song, Revolution, from the dub. I'd forgotten about this one, but now you have to remember it as well. Once upon a time when the world was getting nasty, only 50 years from when we heard the radio boom. Are you dancing yet? Is your body moving on its own? Too bad Ellie's story is that someone took a picture of her naked. Sick. This isn't how we gotta respect women now, y'all! The game is, like, fine, I guess. It's not bad, but it's not great. It's like, if you enjoyed Power Stone, maybe you'll like this Groove Adventure Rave-themed one, even though it's a little more clunky. A lot more clunky. That's where my strength comes from! Sometime last generation, the amount of big licensed games on consoles and PC seemed to kind of peter out. I guess they were like, mm and just switch development to mobile, which, I mean, makes sense, because you see a bunch of them there. However, a couple of games would still trickle out from time to time onto the big consoles, and you would get really weird ones, like, like this. Of all of the movies to receive a video game, never in 4,000 years would I have expected Night at the Museum to get one. The Ben Stiller movie. The freaking Ben Stiller movie got a video game. I think the thing that makes me the most confused and upset about it is that it's actually relatively competent. Sure, the art style's hideous. Sure, Ben Stiller looks like he slept with a truck on his face. And sure, it's based off of a slapstick family movie, but god damn it, did I not completely hate this. The box totes that you can meet and interact with legendary historical figures like Amelia Earhart and Teddy Roosevelt, who is very clearly not played by Robin Williams. But hey, at least we got the, quote, voice and likeness of Ben Stiller. I, I, I don't really see it. So in Night, you play as Larry, who moves from his OG museum to the Smithsonian, just like in the second movie. It's a platformer with a decent amount of mechanics floating about. Rather than directly fighting things, you get a tablet from Ackman Ra, which allows you to, like, cast spells and stuff. You'll summon tentacles out of paintings and activate things. I guess that's where the E10 plus fantasy violence rating comes into play. Tentacles. Some of the platforming elements can be absolutely aggravating. Some of the puzzles are confusing and require a lot of patience, but Night at the Museum exists as a licensed game that isn't at the bottom of the barrel, and that's kind of weird. However, it's pretty cool to see that Ben Stiller was the lead inspiration for The Last Guardian. Hey, boy. Good to see you. So it's time to talk about the game that made me want to make this video in the first place. An import. Now, an import is obviously going to be probably something you haven't heard about, but when I heard that there was a PlayStation 1 Cowboy Bebop game, I had to hop right on that. If you don't like Cowboy Bebop, you're wrong, and I question your taste. Bebop is an absolute classic in every meaning of the word. It's kind of the gateway anime drug. Anyone I know who loves the medium loves them some Bebop. The amazing sci-fi jazz infused martial arts space traveling world building cowboy Bebop has a world that deserves a video game and by God it exists. Huh, that's not the music I expected, but that's okay. As you'd think with the story, it's basically a strange Cowboy Bebop episode. Obviously, I can't understand Japanese, but the story's pretty simple. The Bebop crew gets sucked into an alternate dimension. Oh, it's one of those. <laughs> but to be honest, the story doesn't really matter here. Bebop is a 3D on-rail shmup similar to Star Fox, Sin and Punishment, or Panzer Dragoon. Similarly to Star Fox, the story doesn't really matter much. It's just, hey, there's a bad guy. Go fly to him and shoot him a bunch. And you do. Oof, okay, that was rough. Maybe that was just me. 
no, this game's rough. Like, really rough. Bebop came out in 1998. That's a year after Star Fox 64. Putting them side by side, you'll see that Star Fox really understood how to do the camera. The actual field of vision wouldn't change too much as you moved along the screen. The way that you could easily keep track of things to the front and to the side of you. However, Cowboy Bebop jerks the camera around, making your ship, the swordfish, go off screen quite a bit. When there's physical objects to avoid on the screen, that turns into one big janky mess. There's a lack of control over your ship as well. I can't really tell if the game's equivalent of barrel rolling deflects bullets or not. The all range mode you do against bosses doesn't have any kind of boosters or brakes, so judging your range and speed while avoiding big ass lasers becomes problematic. You can upgrade the swordfish a bit with points you get from missions though, but it's only in the boomy gun category. Nothing defensive or evasive, although I will say that the big red laser feels pretty good. It's just a shame that the soundtrack isn't really Cowboy Bebop Esque. It feels like it was meant for another game entirely and totally lacks the whole heroin infused jazz aesthetic. So when you got Cowboy Bebop without the jazz, swordfish only, janky controls, final destination, what does that leave us with? A licensed game that not many know about and maybe one people shouldn't know about. It's not terrible by any means, but with all of that and a lack of replay value at all, it's barely a rental. You can't save it all, and any of the points you accrue get reset between plays, so it's just a one and done situation. A big shame and a bit of a heartbreak for a huge Bebop fan. Now, this isn't the only Cowboy Bebop game. Supposedly, the PlayStation 1 one was the good one. So I think we all know that means we're gonna be diving into that another time. I'm not excited for that one. Save me. All right, there we have it. 10 licensed games that you probably didn't know existed, and if you have, I'm sorry, please don't hit me. Hey, maybe if y'all like this video, I'll do another one because there's a lot, but for now, I'm gonna go make fajitas, fajitas. Yo, thank you so much for watching. Thank you very much to all my Patreon supporters, and big thanks to Jackets, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Neo Skunk, Flaming Fighter, Ronnie Vile, Superfly1787, Legend Gary, Spaceheart, Christopher Olivia, and Jackets. Thank you guys all so much for your very generous donations. If you liked the video, then hey, watch some more or something. We got we got more coming soon. Also, if you wanna watch me stream, I've been streaming regularly recently, which is pretty rad. We're about to be finished with Corpse Party, so if you wanna do that, go to twitch.tv forward slash Austin Eruption, and I'll catch you guys soon. Love you.